This is Dee Dee River. This is Life is a Leaf. I'm doing this uh, in the dark <laughs> because we don't really have much of a suitable place inside at the moment. Uh, I'm in the middle of building a house, so it makes it difficult A, to get around to doing videos, and B, finding any good place to do them, um, aside from outside. What I wanted to talk about today was the whole uh, J.K. Rowling blah 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 turf, um, and I hate that acronym. We've tended to call them transphobic women because they're not feminists and they're certainly not radical. They're certainly not radical feminists, and radical feminists have kind of disavowed them, many of them. And I just wanted to talk about that, but. Transphobic women is kind of a mouthful, so TERF is just so easy to say. There's been a lot of stuff done recently about J.K. Rowling and her transphobic comments, and it's really disgusting. I'm planning on making a couple of videos that will be pertinent to that issue, one on identity and one on um, culture wars and one on intent. And the one on intent or intention is probably the most pertinent one to this particular issue. Because when these people, J.K. Rowling and her ilk, are talking about biological sex, biological sex, biological sex, they're really trying to establish a narrative. The intent is not feminism, and we're protecting women in any way. It's attacking trans people and they feel like the one irrefutable way they can attack trans people is through biological sex. But this concern for biological sex is an example of bad intention, partly because biological sex is not something anybody deals with on an ordinary day-to-day -day basis. We have no idea about other people's biology generally, unless they happen to be your partner or possibly your parent or your child, or your doctor may know something about your biology, but probably not a whole lot. And most of us haven't got a clue about our own biology. And this is something very interesting in terms of uh, the intersex community and, you know, people who are talking to Rowling in these turfs often use the intersex example to say that biology isn't as straightforward as you're making it out. And this is perfectly true. Because sexual differentiation is very complex, and it's not a matter of chromosomes, except for the fact that certain genes happen to usually reside on certain chromosomes, but not always. There are people who are, for example, SRY negative, even though they have a Y chromosome. There are people who are SRY positive, even though they have two X chromosomes. That's because the SRY gene might get recombined into the other chromosome. There are also a number of other genes that are involved in differentiation. And while the number of people who have a variation of sexual characteristics that results in them being obviously somewhere between male and female in terms of their sexual characteristics at birth is relatively small, but the number of people who have variations of sexual characteristics that in some way put them be between male and female is very much larger. It's something equivalent to the number of people who have red hair or who are blonde. Yeah, it is a whole lot of people. And a lot of those people may never realize that they are intersex. Yeah. Some of those people, as they approach puberty, 
the genes may kick up, kick in and create some obvious differentiation. For a number of people, that doesn't happen either. And for example, the Olympic committees, since, you know, uh, the 30s, I believe, is when they started doing some sort of testing and realized that a lot of athletes are actually intersex. Yeah. And when they started doing genetic testing, they discovered that they are definitely intersex. And you have people who are competing as women who were assigned female at birth, who grew up as women, who went through puberty apparently as women, who may have gotten married as women, who have lived all their lives as women and are competing as women. And yet they have an X and a Y chromosome. Uh, because, in fact, they're intersex, and the genetic differences have resulted in them basically differentiating sexually in almost every way that matters as female. And this includes the level of testosterone and all kinds of things. You know, um, and they actually had to reveal to some athletes that, hey, you know, you're, you've always thought you were a girl, you got married as a girl, you were born as a girl, and all that, but you're really a boy. Uh, it's pretty messy. The Olympic committees have had to deal with the existence of intersex people and now transgender people for some time. And primarily, the focus has been on intersex people because those are the people who often have no idea that they are the other sex, so to speak, until they actually get tested in some way. And most of us have never been tested. We have no idea what our biology is like. Most of us have no idea how many chromosomes we have and which chromosomes we have. And we certainly don't look at it at the level of genetics, which means effectively that in almost all cases, biology doesn't matter. You know, where it ends up mattering is for some intersex people. Yeah, a lot of intersex people, particularly the ones who've had medical interference, non-consensual medical interference in early childhood, either in infancy or very early in their childhood. Almost all of those people are assigned female. Now, they grow up and they may say, hey, this isn't who I am. And of course, the famous case is John Money, uh, one of the early scholars, academics, doctors, medical professionals who dealt with gender. And he tried to show that how you are socialized determines your gender. He had one particular patient. John Money actually decided it was a better thing to cut off his penis, make him a girl, and raise him as a girl. John Money used this as a case to say, yeah, yeah, see, socialization really works, except that it really didn't. And this case is actually scandalous in all kinds of ways. Maybe someday I'll talk about that. The upshot is that later in his life, he said, no, I'm not a girl, I'm a boy. He discovered the um, procedures that had gone on and which had been hidden from him in order to help him socially transition and socially adjust. And when he discovered this, yeah, you know, he was really upset. And this particular person ended up killing himself later in his life because he had a terrible time. The intersex rights movement is extremely interesting because 
almost everybody, there's been all kinds of studies and all kinds of people have, have in the last 40 years or so, have presented this as basically a horrible situation where intersex infants, people, intersex people who are obviously intersex at infancy or who become obvious at puberty and are non-consensually given surgery and hormones and all this sort of stuff, that this is horrific, particularly since some of them may be quite happy with that and some of them aren't happy at all. But the main point is nobody bloody asked. And the doctors just decided to do these things. And they often go to parents and say, oh, this is important and you've got to do this for their social you know, growth and all that kind of stuff. Even though in many cases it isn't physically necessary, yeah, particularly for children, they could physically have their intersex uh, variations and just be in that. And you know, this often works better than giving them surgery as, as an infant or a toddler and then having to revise that surgery when they're seven or eight and then having to revise that surgery again when they hit puberty and then having to revise and so on. And the results are often not good. The intersex people, if you are interested in that, there are intersex organizations who have made these points for a long time. Now what I'm saying is that although this point has been made and nations around the world have investigated the situation and said, yes, this is wrong. This is a human rights abuse. The UN has called it the equivalent of torture. Uh, Twelve UN organizations have said, you know, this is awful and needs to be changed. And people around the world have said, this needs to be changed. And virtually nobody does anything. The Australian government, I'm Australian in spite of my accent, the Australian government has had federal commissions that looked into this and they found that uh, what goes on is wrong and nothing has been done on any in any jurisdiction any legal jurisdiction and the reason is because dealing with anything to do with sex or gender is political <sighs> You know, you're going to get the Murdoch press screaming and you're going to get the, uh, the Australian Christian lobby screaming and the Catholic Church and the Anglican Church and so on. You, you saw this in relation to the trans rights stuff that happened in consequence of the marriage equality. Finally, in Australia, marriage equality was legalized. And for a long time, most trans people, in terms of their birth certificates in Australia, and that is on a state basis, were only allowed to transition if they had had genital surgery to make them look like the other. That's something the government decided. It said that if a trans person wanted to change their sex and had had surgery, then they must also not be married, which means if they are married, they've got to get a divorce. And this has been a huge issue. And the reason it was, of course, that if you have somebody who's had surgery and all that stuff, and they were married before, suddenly you've got a gay marriage. <gasps> and gay marriage was illegal. And so you can't have that. So anybody married, you know, either had to put up with having a birth certificate that said that they were the other gender, even if they'd had surgery or else they had to divorce their partners, even if they loved them and wanted to keep living together. And this is fairly horrific. Um, when the marriage equality bill passed, part of that said, look, you've got to stop that part at least. And in a lot of jurisdictions, there was at least some debate about also getting rid of the requirement for surgery. Here in Tasmania, I was involved in 
the particular legal battle, which we ended up winning. And in Tasmania now, changing gender on your birth certificate is now perfectly legal, perfectly easy. All you have to do is get a statutory declaration. The registrar of uh, births, deaths, and marriages still has power to say to somebody that they think is doing it for some sort of pernicious or malicious or deceptive purposes to say, no, you can't do that. Uh, just like they have the power, you know, people can change their names. And in the same way, the registrar for births, deaths, and marriages who controls name changes can say, no, you can't call yourself Trump is a shithead. You know, uh, that's not a valid name. So they basically say, there are limits to what you can actually do. But it's pretty broadly interpreted. And this is fabulous for a lot of people who don't necessarily want or need surgery. And this should actually help address the concerns of those transphobic women who say, oh, these people are having irreversible surgery. We have to help them by not allowing anybody to have surgery. Isn't that clever? Isn't that a clever little twist of the knife? And this is where I go back into intent because the intention of these people, although they present themselves as wanting to help women or help children or help trans people who may have made a mistake or something like this, that's what they say, but the intention is to stop trans people. And the whole argument about biology is really about creating a separation between sex and gender so that you can discriminate on the basis of sex and say trans people aren't allowed in bathrooms, trans people aren't allowed in this, that, and the other thing. Trans people are their biological sex, which we don't even know because huh, your biological sex is not what is used on your birth certificate. When you're assigned female or male at birth, hey, they don't check your biology much. All they do is kind of look between the legs and say, uh, looks like a... And we've had midwives who say, yeah, in a lot of cases, it's a best guess. Uh, anyway, the thing that bothers me most is that many very well-meaning trans people who are advocating for trans people will say things like, look, we know what our biology is. We have to deal with that all the time. Of course we know what our biology is. It's about gender. And I think this misses the point that the argument really isn't about biology. The argument is, can we find a basis to discriminate against you? And the basis for discrimination that they want to use is sex. And we've seen this clearly with the particular, there were two women who are women speak Tasmania. In spite of the fact that the women's legal service and most of the women's shelters, four major women's services got together and put out a press release after Women Speak was getting a whole lot of press in Fox Media and in all of the stuff Rupert Murdoch owned. You know, they were given heaps of airspace to put out their transphobic nonsense. This group of women's organizations who actually deal with women's uh, shelters and women's spaces said, we've been inclusive for a long time. We have trans clients, and it is no problem. We've already sorted it out. We have policies for all of that sort of thing. Um, and moreover, it's the trans people who are most at risk of violence. Yeah, 
So they basically came out and said that. And they also said, and these people who are women speak, they didn't talk to us and they haven't talked to any women or women's organizations we know of. I know that one of these two got a lot of airspace because she was basically thrown out of the women's collective at the University of Tasmania, mainly because her main issue for women was opposing trans people. Now, they later on made alliances with the Catholic Church and the Australian Christian League, those bastions of women's rights and uh, opposing patriarchy. This is shortly after the four-year inquiry in Australia that looked into institutional child abuse and found that the Catholic Church was the major offender and the, uh, the Anglican Church and other religious organizations who tend to be given institutional control because they're good people mm. of children and they said child abuse is rife there, this inquiry, and the Catholic Church particularly. But the Catholic Church got together and funded this organization. I think it was called Tasmanian Kids for Kids, yeah, or something like that. It was this thing of let kids be kids, yeah, which really means let kids be cis, white, heterosexual and let's cram that down, the, the gender roles, down their throat, because that's what's, quote, normal, unquote. Okay, well, the transphobic women joined right in with this group. They felt it was obviously a natural fit to be in a group run by men, run by the Catholic Church and the Australian Christian League, although the Catholic Women's League was in there as well. And they came to Parliament during one of the briefings for the Legislative Council, which is the Tasmanian Upper House. And they presented all this sort of fear of, you know, oh, children are being swept away by the trans agenda. And, you know, men might call themselves transgender and get into locker rooms and blah, 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 blah. And most of the legislative council and council people are independents here and are pretty good. And they turned around, they'd heard all this before, and they turned around and said, well, you're representing yourself as a kids group, a, a group concerned primarily with Tasmanian kids. What other kids' issues do you deal with aside from transgender people? And the answer was, um, we, we plan to have something sometime in the future. In other words, no, they don't do anything but transgender stuff, anti-transgender stuff. And did they go ahead and do something in the future? No. They took down their uh, Facebook page. Uh, they, I think they've just dissolved, you know, the legislative past. So, you know, there was no point in them being there anymore. And this is the point, in a way, that these people are not concerned with what they say they are concerned with. These transphobic women, I don't know how many other women's issues they're interested in. Yeah, I would guess that they're not pushing hard against domestic abuse, for example. You see that in the Anglican Church, for example, during the marriage debate, the Anglican Church put a, a million dollars into the anti-marriage debate when the Anglican Synod had gotten together and said, we want to make an issue about domestic violence. And they gave almost no money to domestic violence. This is the Archbishop of uh, Sydney. Um, he gave a million dollars to fight gay marriage. Now, that's kind of the point, that these things may be represented as this or that, 
but they're really part of the culture war. And I would suggest to trans activists, instead of saying, yes, of course we realize our biology is different. There's a difference between sex and gender. That differentiation was made by trans people and by academics in order to discuss being transgender and what that means and what that is. It wasn't meant as a social legal differentiation. And I suggest that your response instead of, of course, we, we understand there's a difference between sex and gender. I suggest instead of that, your response should be, biology really isn't taken into account. Nobody checks your biology in law. Nobody checks your biology in dating. When you meet people, you don't go on the basis of your chromosomes. You don't go on the basis of your genes, and most people haven't got a clue anyway. All social activity happens on the basis of gender. And that is the only criteria we should be looking at. And to say legally a person is a man or a woman is a social definition. And that social definition is based on gender, on who a person is. Now, my own take is that I hope that with non-binary identities and the plethora of genders and so on, these walls of gender will begin to break down. I mean, we've already seen the famous 72 different genders you know, uh, that alt-right people make fun of. But thank God, what it is really is most of the time we look at human behavior through a gendered lens and we say this behavior is masculine behavior and that behavior is feminine behavior. This way of dressing is masculine dressing. That way is feminine dressing. And these ways are unisex or androgynous or something like that. But why do we have this gendered lens? I, really, when people wear clothes, it's just bits of cloth that we stick on ourselves. Yeah, and we have different senses of fashion and things we like and different colors we like and different styles we like. And that's just diversity. That's just preference, personal preference. And if we can get away from that's feminine dress, that's masculine dress, and just say that's dress, this frees us up a whole lot we can dress any way we like. It has no reflection on our gender. Or it may reflect our personal gender, our only personal sense of who we are. And the plethora of non-binary people and all of the diversity of the different ways people do non-binary is fabulous. Yeah, I actually see it as, okay, yeah, it's as if one side of the ocean, say California, is male, and the other side, say China, is female. And we act as if there's only these two things, when really there's an entire ocean in between. And we're all swimming in that ocean. And that ocean not only has side to side, it has up, down, it's three-dimensional, it has deep, shallow, and everything else. We can be any gender we want. And gender diversity, when you get down to it, is only human diversity. And this is what we should be looking at. My own preference, what we first suggested, was that instead of making it easy to change your gender, on a birth certificate was simply leaving it off because in legal terms it should have no bearing on people at all. Yeah. 
And people say, oh, but what about prisons? Prisons have already dealt with that, by and large, because they have transgender people, and prisons have a duty of care to prisoners. Whether they're good at that or not is a different discussion, but you know, most of the prisons would agree they have a duty of care to look after the people that they have imprisoned. And that means you don't put somebody with breasts who has been on hormones, female hormones, for 10 years, even if they have a penis still, and particularly if they don't have a penis, you don't put them in, in a prison with men because the, the outcome is pretty bloody obvious. And you don't take a trans man who, in spite of the fact that they might look ma male, often has not had bottom surgery because a bottom surgery costs $100,000. Nobody in Australia does it. You'd have to go overseas for it. And it's often not necessary in terms of people's personal relationships. Some people do it because it's necessary in relation to their own body. But in relation to their social interactions, it's not necessary at all. However, if you're going to put somebody in prison, you wouldn't want to put somebody, even if they've had top surgery, even if they have a beard, even if they look masculine, you wouldn't want to put that person in a male prison if they have a vagina, because, well, the outcome is bloody obvious. Uh, you don't want people almost certainly to be raped. You don't want people probably to be assaulted. You don't want people quite possibly killed. And that happens. Anyway, my main point is that instead of agreeing to these distinctions between sex and gender, which people will then turn and use to try and create discrimination on the basis of sex, you know, to increase discrimination using anti-discrimination law, and the uh, transphobic women here tried that on with the anti-discrimination commissioner. They tried to see a reform of the anti-discrimination law to create a distinction where sex was a protected group and uh, you could discriminate against trans people on the basis of sex. And thankfully our anti-discrimination commissioner said, no, you don't get to do this, use anti-discrimination law in order to discriminate against people. Anyway, that is their bottom line. That is what they're aiming for. They're aiming for the erasure and of trans people and the discrimination against trans people. And so don't give them any kind of fuel. It's important not to give them that kind of fuel. Because if you do, they will use it. It is intentional. Instead, say, no, biology makes no difference in terms of human interaction and society and law. A person can be male or female before the law, regardless of their biology. People already are male or female before the law in regard to their biology. And all of social interaction and all of legal interaction is based on gender. And that's the line we need to take. Okay, well this has been Life is a Leaf. I'm going to get back to some of these other issues in coming videos. Thanks a lot. Um, have fun. <laughs> Happy Pride. See you later.